Okay, we can try again. You are sharing. Is that you or me? Oh, that's you. Yeah, okay. we're back to normal. Here we go. Hang on a second, okay. and we should be going live here again. And I guess we're live again, folks. So, All right. uh, we're welcome back. back. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see what that did. Um, so, looking for some comments first of all, I guess, to see if we're back again. So, anybody uh, who's joined on here, could you let us know how our volume is? Yes. We'll wait for a couple of comments, Paul. Okay. No one back yet. That's all right. Hello out there. Hey, Peter. Audio is great. Thanks, Peter. There Let's we go. We'll do a check here. Check one, two. And Paul? Check test. One, two, three. Hello. There. We're back. We're back. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you borrow somebody else's computer and you try to do setups on it. So. <laughs> oh, perfect. Okay, good. And Trudy said she can hear us too. Thanks, Trudy. Appreciate it. Thank so you. we're back at it again. So anyway, we were discussing about, uh, yeah, this, uh, this uh, coronavirus that we're all dealing with at the moment. Uh, anybody, if anybody has any extra toilet paper, I'd be glad to, to uh, pay for a roll or two. <laughs> I want to make a fork. I got all, all the plungers. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand what the craze is on toilet paper. I, I, what I, heard, I heard today, actually, that um, it started in Australia, apparently. And uh, because uh, Australia gets most of their toilet paper from China, and China was shutting down their factories, so they all went into a panic, apparently, and then it yeah. went from there right world, worldwide. So I guess it's it's everywhere. So anyway, we'll uh, we'll have to get through it the best we can. <laughs> I guess it, it, us being astronomers would call it moon floss. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> one of them shows. <laughs> Anyway, if, 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 you, if, if you need uh, 40 rolls of toilet paper, I think you got problems long before this uh, coronavirus ever come out. <laughs> so you better, you best get to your doctor and get things straightened out. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Anyway, tonight, this evening, we're going to do a little bit of a talk on uh, daytime astronomy. I mean, a lot of people don't think about uh, astronomy as being done in the daytime. Hey, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, daytime astronomy uh, and... Um, how to use a solar scope. Uh, solar scopes, of course, are, are dedicated just for uh, the sun, nothing else, dedicated solar scopes. Uh, but we also have uh, scopes that we can install a white light filter on, which allows us to use a, a normal telescope through the daytime. So Paul's going to give us a little bit of a talk here on solar scopes. Um, and then we're going to go from that probably to uh, some Rosanna's uh, fun facts. Uh, I may be doing a talk, a presentation, a little bit of a talk on a presentation that I had started uh, at the Hampton uh, Beginners Astronomy Workshop uh, recently, which was also been postponed now for a while um, due to the uh, the virus uh, scare, I guess. Uh, but anyway, I've got a few slides to show on that, uh, and hopefully we'll get a view of uh, maybe M81 and M82 later on uh, as the sky gets a little bit darker through our program. So let's get started, maybe, Paul, with, uh, with your talk on uh, solar scopes, if you don't mind. All right. All right. Well, actually, what I'm going to talk about tonight, it's really, really bright outside. So I got my sunglasses on. I'm sitting outside and it's a wonderful afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a wonderful afternoon. It was, yeah. So what I'm going to talk about tonight um, is not so much just a specific solar scope. Let me just put my... Um, so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. Not pre just a, a specific solar scope, but just solar uh, observing in general. A Pacific? And some of the things that um, some of the things that you'll need to uh, to do some safe solar observing. So of course, uh, the nice thing about astronomy is it's not only for nighttime. It's also for daytime. So if you're uh, being clouded out at night, but you got a nice sunny afternoon, well, there's no reason why you can't do some uh, some astronomy. And the sun provides us with all kinds of great things to look at. Um, so now, in the last few years, of course, we've been in a solar minimum. So there's certain portions of the sun that um, <clears throat> that aren't really uh, very exciting to look at, and those would be the sunspots because there really isn't a whole lot of them. Um, and because again, we're in that minimum, but I think we're starting to swing out of it a little bit and there's a tiny little bit of activity happening here and there. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about how to look at the sun, um, uh, sunspots 
and the things that you'll need to do that. And then we can turn around and look at um, how to look at other features of the sun, uh, which would be like the prominences, um, and some of the filaments and some of the, the surface uh, detail that you can look at and the kind of things that you'll need to, uh, to look at that as well. So, um, so I think what I'll do is I'll start with white light uh, uh, observing. And white light observing, of course, is what we would use when we want to look at uh, the sunspots. And um, let me just grab a sample of that. So what a white light filter does is it basically takes in it, and this is what this is a white light filter that's actually made for a very specific size telescope. So you can see that um, depending on the size of your telescope, you can get them um, for uh, very, very small telescopes. You can get them for much, much larger telescopes, but the, the paper does the same um, work on both telescopes in terms of uh, re um, uh, uh, rejecting most of the light, um, 94. 95 to 98 percent of the light these will reject and just allow through enough that you can actually see some surface detail and the surface detail you'll see with these typically will be sunspots and if you've got a lot of aperture like this larger telescope um, then you can also see a lot of uh, what they call which is uh, granulation which is a lot of that it would look like a little bumpy surface on there i'll give you some examples um, of that um, as we go along um, you can also um, buy the solar paper and a company called Bader Planetarium makes it and <clears throat> excuse me and uh, this one here is uh, I'm not sure exactly the size of this piece of paper but it's enough to do a couple of filters so basically you can buy the paper itself and then it gives you instructions as to how to make a filter which is really quite simple um, we had a, a class on uh, doing filters when we had the uh, partial solar eclipse uh, come out and so our, our astronomy club got together and we bought a whole bunch of this stuff and we brought everybody in and we had a really really fun day making all these filters and then on the next day we went out and we actually did some uh, some solar observing so so you can buy this paper and it's not too too expensive to buy but you but the nice thing about it is in fact that it's safe and I want to also point out that you can buy paper for observing and you can buy paper for imaging so there are two different um, grades of solar filters so when you buy your filter you notice on this one i'll put it up close so you can see it this one says visual and this is visual as well but if i had a, a photographic one then that little uh, stamp down there would say photographic so you can use um, a visual uh, filter for both visual and photographic but if you've got a photographic one, you probably don't want to use it for visual because it's, it allows more light to get through and it wouldn't be quite as safe for, uh, for observing. So, Also, you can get these filters. Um, you don't see too many of these around that much anymore. It looks like it's the same kind of thing as the, the filter, but this is actually a glass. And when you look through this, instead of seeing just like a, basically a white disc or something in black and white, this one here, you would actually see a yellow disc. So it gives off a different color. Um, and I don't know if I could point that out of light. Be able to see the, this, if I can reflect this. No, I guess I'm not gonna be able to show you that way, but in any event, when you're looking through this one here, it would look yellow. It's doing the same thing, but it's just a glass as opposed to a, to a, to a tin foil. So that's the difference between those. So that'll cover basically the white light filters. Now, the, the next thing that you're gonna be wanting to look at uh, once you get below the photosphere is the chromosphere. And in the chromosphere, that's where a lot of cool in information is and a lot of very cool things to look at. Um, and you need a special filter for that. Now, it's not a white light filter and it's what they call a hydrogen alpha filter. And there's a, and it's not you're not gonna buy it like filter paper like that. You have to actually get it in, either, in the form of a telescope like this, which is this color scope here is specifically for hydrogen alpha. And that's all this telescope does. It doesn't do anything else. Or if you have a telescope and it's a refractor, um, like this one or the one that you see in behind, then you can use this device here. And this is called a quark. And when this is made by a company called Daystar, and, um, and Daystar make a number of uh, solar uh, filters in many, many, many facets, very, very high-end professional. Uh, this is considered low-end. Us astronomers is considered high-end because it's still very expensive, mm -hmm. but they call it 
very inexpensive. And what this cork filter is, is uh, it's, a, it's a filter that's designed to cut the band pass, the, white, uh, the light path, to a point where you can see the prominences. So this is what they call the prominence model. You can buy another one that's also called the chrominance model, which again is just a slight shift in the band path so that you can actually see more of the surface detail as opposed to the, uh, to the prominent detail. But keep in mind that both of these filters will allow you to see not only excuse me, not only uh, prominence, which would be the main thing for this one, but you can also see surface detail and vice versa on the chrominance model, you can see a lot of surface, but you can still also see prominence. And how you do that is this little device right here gives you 0.5 angstrom that you can move uh, up to eight times. So you can make some really, really fine adjustments on this. So in the center position, it would be the, the native um, filtration that you would want for hydrogen alpha, give you some very, very nice views. But if you want to fine tune more to one side or the other, being prominence or maybe chrominance, then basically you just adjust this little filter switch right there. And this one here is designed like an IP. So it's designed first for observing. So what you would do is if you want to use a one and a quarter inch eyepiece, it's all set up for that. So it will actually slide in to a one and a quarter inch setting like this telescope here. If this wasn't a solar scope, that one and a quarter inch setting, which is the same size as most people's eyepieces. So it would fit into there. If I had a two inch um, uh, telescope diagonal to go into, then that's what you would use this side and that'll drop right in as a two inch. So it doesn't matter whether it's one and a quarter or two inch, this is designed to work with both. Now, the thing with this one here is um, when you're using these in refractors, you can use them in refractors anywhere from, um, uh, I think it's, let's see now. Yeah, it's um, 80 millimeters up to 150 millimeters is what you can use this in the refractors. So from say a 60 to an 80 millimeter, you can use this straight in the telescope. You don't have to worry about anything, but anything that gets beyond 80 millimeters, so once it gets into say 100, 110 or whatever, um, then you have to use an energy rejection filter, which is what I have on the end of this. Basically it's a UVIR cut filter and you have to buy that separate. And the reason that you do is because when you put that in, when you start using those longer focal lengths, there's more concentration of light and actually starts to create some heat. So in order to keep things safe and not overheat your uh, diagonal or whatever your, your telescope that you're looking through, this filter here actually uh, makes that as a safeguard. So that's something that you would have to buy as an accessory if you're using anything above an 80 millimeter uh, refractor. And speaking of which, these operate only on refractors. Um, so that's basically the Daystar cork. So that's another way to observe the sun. And then of course, thirdly, we have um, the Solar Max uh, 60, and these come in a, ver in a variety of sizes. You can get um, what they call the, uh, the PST, which is a personal solar telescope made by Mead, and um, it's, um, it's, it's quite a bit smaller in terms of its uh, diameter. I think it's, um, it may only be like 40 millimeters. I'm pretty sure it's a 40 millimeter diameter or aperture on the end. This one here is a 60 millimeter. And the focal length of this is 400 millimeters. So <clears throat> if I'm using um, like a regular eyepiece in here, like this comes with a 25 millimeter eyepiece, then I can see the full disc of the sun and I can see some stuff around it. And the reason I can, oops, is because this comes with what they call a, this is one part of the telescope that you need. And this is called the diagonal, but it's also called the blocker. And basically after the front of the telescope where the light goes through, the, li the light will bounce back and forth between two plates. It'll basically break it down into a wavelength, send it down like in the form of a comb. And then this is where it makes everything safe and then makes it um, so that you see one image and it kind of separates the stray light that you don't want and just passes through the, um, the hydrogen alpha. I'm gonna let you look in the center. So right up in there, that little hole that you see, that's actually 10 millimeters. Um, so you can get these in five, 10, 15, and I think maybe 20. And all that means is the size of that hole gets larger. And as it gets larger, then it becomes more effective for photography. Because if you just use a five millimeter one, 
it's pretty hard to get a full disc on your camera chip. But this is a 10 millimeter one, and I can actually put a DSLR in here and, uh, and get a full frame uh, of whatever it is that I'm shooting on the sun, which works out very nicely. Or if I want to get closer, I can pop a barrel on it, and then I can go ahead and, uh, and use it for that. But for those that are observing, um, most eyepieces will work just fine in this. When we're out doing um, uh, outreach, I'll use a Bader um, 8 to 24 millimeter zoom eyepiece. And that way there, if somebody wants to see full disc, I just zoom out to 24 millimeters, they can see full disc. And if they want to see really close up images, or if we get a lot of activity going on in terms of really, really active prominences, then I can zoom in to say, you know, 12 millimeters or, or even down to eight and get some really nice close up uh, views uh, with that zoom eyepiece. So if you have a solar mat or a, a hydrogen alpha telescope, um, I always recommend just go ahead and get a really good um, zoom eyepiece and, uh, and you'll have all kinds of flexibility in terms of the features that you look at. When you do buy these, they do come with um, a 25 millimeter eyepiece. They color it the same color, make it look pretty, but really it's just a, it's a 25 millimeter blossom is really what that is. I'll put that in there and that just slips in here. And how you use this telescope is very, very simple. So if I'm going to go out and I want to look at uh, the sun, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use my soul, my soul ranger. So what it does is there's a little um, a dot or a little hole in the very, very tip of this. So you point that towards the sun and then on this other end, you got a nice round uh, disc and it shows you the dot of the sun. So all you simply do is line up your mount so that the dot of the sun is in the center of this and that centered is on the scope. Then when you look in your eyepiece, you've got the sun in there. So it's easy to find the sun with this. And then all you're doing from that point, excuse me, is um, what I always do is I just take this and, I, and by looking at it at the same time, I'd be doing this and then I would get that as close to focus as I possibly can. And then once it's really, really close, then this has what they call a ring focus on it. So it just shifts like this. So then I'm just going to look in there and I'm going to get my fine tune, um, focus fine tune. So it's nice and sharp. And then from there, if I want to look at a variety of different things on the sun, if I want to look at more surface as opposed to prominence, then this adjuster right up here basically tilts these plates from one off of the other. And by tilting those plates off of one off the other, then what that does, that actually shifts a bit of the wavelength. So if I want to see more of the surface wavelength, then I just tilt it one way. If I want to see more of the prominence, then I would certainly tilt it the other way. So it's a, once you catch on to it, it's a very, very simple telescope to use, but uh, it gives you just an amount of, um, unlimited amount of fun because you can use that in the daytime if, you know, if you're, you know, if you're out, we use it all the time at um, star parties because people want to see solar stuff in the daytime. So the daytime we have our solar scopes out. We enjoy daytime astronomy. It's beautiful. Um, if you're a photographer like I am, you can get some really, really nice uh, photography done. And if you're an observer, it's, actually, it's great and it works right until the sun goes down. And then you, you grab your other scope and use that. So I'm going to show just a few examples now of what you can actually do with this. I'm going to share my screen and pretend I know what I'm doing here. I'll share the screen. <laughs> And we'll go here and share that one. So um, there we go. So I'm going to show you an example of what, now remember when we talked about the white light filter, which is that solar paper, the very first one I showed you. So this is what you would see there. So this, what you're looking at now is I was using a, um, uh, a C8, which is a, a Smith Cassegrain 2000 millimeter. So it's a pretty long focal length back when the sun was active. And, uh, and that's what you would see. So when you're looking through that white light filter, you're gonna see no color. And that's why it's, it's designed that way so that you're only seeing it um, monochromatically. And, uh, but you can see on there and I'll use my mouse. Can you see my mouse working there? Yes, we can, yep. Okay, so, so these are sunspots. So this would be the uh, penumbra, which is the outer portion and the umbra. And you can see a lot of very, very nice detail there. This, by the way, is, is just dust on the camera. <laughs> That's nothing. <laughs> well, I wouldn't but, have known. You could have well, there, there. Now you know. There. How did dust get on the sun? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, and here you can see all kinds of granulation. And I think I call it fel felcula, felcula. Facula. 
And um, so when you look at this in black and white, it's very nice. So it gives, you know, because it's luminance, there's a lot of dynamic range in it. So this is the kind of view you would have through a, a smith cast grain using a white light filter. If I was to image this, which is what this is, I took a picture of it, and then you can just add some false color to it and make it look really kind of cool. So, you know, the sun we, we deem as being yellow. And, um, and so there is kind of how you would uh, take a photograph using your scope, camera, and, uh, and this filter. And there's a nice picture of the sunspots. Nice, really nice. So there uh, is another thing that, you know, wow. the reason I'm showing you this one is because this is what it would look like if you're using a smaller telescope and you want to see the whole disc. That was so yesterday. Looking, yeah, isn't that something? That wasn't yesterday. No, no. <laughs> wow, well, that's a lot of activity. 20, 2014, I think it was. Oh, yeah. When the nice. sun was actually, uh, it was doing some stuff. Mm. Um, so this would be through a, a 110 millimeter refractor with a DSLR and a white light filter over the front of it. And that's what you can, that's what you would see. It's absolutely stunning. Now, um, this is what, uh, um, this is just a little video. I'm just going to push the button and you can see that kind of jiggling around. So that jiggles around the same as if you're watching the moon or anything else, because if you know if you're looking at the sun, you still have to go through the surface detail and you're getting a lot of that turbulence. So you can see the cloud passing by there now. So the whole point behind that is um, in order to get a shot like that to make it look like a picture, you use a little fast frame rate camera and then you take your frames, stack them and come up with your photograph. This is one that you would see through a solar telescope. Um, and this is actually shot through a PST. And so I'm just playing the video. So you can see if you were actually observing, this is kind of what you would see. So you would see a little bit of shiver, a little bit of shake. It's not the sun doing anything. It's just the sun's light coming through the atmosphere. But this is kind of um, um, what you would see if you were looking at through a PST and you wanted to see um, um, the prominences. So you can see some prominences sticking out there and there were still some sunspots. And if you want to make a photograph of it, it would kind of look like that. And that quick, that, see how quickly that changed? <laughs> so let me just do that again. This is going through an H-alpha telescope, having the camera set to mono, in other words, no color. And this is the image that you could see through the camera and take a picture of. It's going to quickly revert back to what the camera sees because that was actually a raw image. And if you leave it on there, it'll just go back to raw data with no uh, processing done. That's strictly right off the sensor. And uh, another video, again, showing you, so you can see down here, there's some major prominence is going on. Very, very active uh, there. And this stuff you can see even now, even though the sun's not really that active, there's still prominence is happening. So if you had an H alpha scope, even though we got solar minimum going on. Uh, that's just another, um, uh, oh, that was another one. It's called um, the solar wedge and it always shows things in green. And um, uh, these particular things they say are the best uh, white light filters and uh, Bader make them. And um, you can see the lot of granulation on that. So you get extremely, extreme amounts of surface detail uh, when you're using that, uh, that filter. And again, you make a photograph of it. When you're imaging it, basically a, a planetary camera, just like this one right here, stick it into the diagonal if you're shooting white light. And of course, on the very end of that telescope, it would be a piece of paper. And then it would just, you just record it on your camera and then stack it and then make a picture. Um, when I was using that cork, that, um, the one that looks like an eyepiece, it's four eyepieces. It was, I was using it on this telescope. That's a camera there, but the cork would stick in just the same way. And you would pop it on the end of that scope and you can visual, um, you can uh, use it as, um, sorry, <laughs> you can use it as, um, um, uh, for visual and for, uh, and for imaging as well. Uh, let me just get rid of that. Sorry guys. And uh, let me see if there's anything else on here. Oh, and the cork, the cork gives you this kind of detail. So when you look at that screen, um, it's just absolutely amazing. I mean, look how high and, and defined those prominences are. And again, that's something that you would use. I used that 110 millimeter telescope track refractor in the last slide with the cork and just unbelievable the stuff you can get. And this one here was done with a solar max. That's the one that our, our club currently uses for a header. 
but you can see again all kinds of prominences on there all kinds of surface detail and uh and that would have been shot with my solar max 60 uh telescope and finally this was the mercury transit that a lot of us saw and a lot of us didn't see and so that would be the sun and that little spot right there is not a pimple that's actually mercury uh, making its transit and we uh, just happened to catch it as the clouds are just breaking up a little bit so that's what you see all over the surface of the sun is just cloud detail um, and finally I, this is the last picture um, this is what you can get when you use a hydrogen alpha scope take some time stack some images and you can see detail to the cows come home kind of looks like a tennis ball but <clears throat> the reason it does is this was actually what they call reverse <laughs> Uh, 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 imaging. So everything there is, is backwards. So that white filament typically would be black. And those black sunspots uh, or black areas here would typically be, would be white and whatnot. Um, but it was just uh, shot that way so that you could see all that detail. So you can see the sun is a very active um, thing to look at in the daytime. So if you want to look at daytime, um, daytime things, the sun is absolutely stunning to look at. Excellent. Good stuff, Paul. That's my story. <laughs> and you're sticking to it. I'm sticking to I it. I assume. Uh, we did have a question here from Peter. Peter's asking, yeah. uh, have you ever used a Herschel wedge? And uh, yes. he says he has one and it's pretty good. So, yeah. <clears throat> yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I had one myself. And um, I had it for quite a few years. And it was the one with uh, uh, the, the Herschel. I can't remember the name on it, but it had all the three different filters and it was the photographic one. And fantastic, absolutely beautiful piece of equipment. So yes, Peter, uh, and if you've got one, you're a lucky man. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, no, that's that's amazing. Like, and yeah, people don't think about doing astronomy in the daytime. I guess you know. Um, I mean, we, we do have the moon up occasionally and the odd planet if you're able to find out where they are. But uh, what the sun is is certainly an object that we can all take a look at uh, safely. Um, I know they've even got. Uh, I, I know Mike had a set of um, solar filters for his binoculars. That he, yes, uh, that's he snapped right. on over the top of them. Yeah, they were like elastic, kind of stretchy kind of things, but he set right over the top of the binoculars. They kind of neat. Now, I tried to look for those again on eBay, and they're gone now, so I don't know what <laughs> happened to the company. But that may be a whole China thing, too, because Mike usually gets everything from China. But uh, they're, they're, they're quite a, an idea. So, yeah, in, of course, eclipse glasses are another option for you, too. Uh, you can get the sun as a tiny white ball, but, but certainly during, um, during an eclipse of any type, like uh, next year we have a... Uh, a partial solar eclipse right here in St. John, uh, June the 10th, I believe it is, 2021. Uh, it's going to be about 70% or 75% blocked uh, by the moon. So that'll be a great occasion to have so lots of solar eclipse glasses handy for, for outreach kind of thing. Hopefully by that time we'll be we'll be back doing outreach. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly by that time, I would assume. Yes. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, thanks very much for that talk. That's perfect. Uh, so Hi. people, if you're looking at solar scopes or, uh, or a dedicated PST, a personal solar telescope, then... Uh, Paul's the guy to talk to. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so uh, from there, uh, oh, Mike's talking. Oh, Mike's Itty Bitty Radio Telescope. Yeah, Mike, you know something? We're going to save oh, that thanks. one. We're going to save that one for next week if you're back on uh, on, on air with Mike's here watching this from, from his work, <laughs> keeping an eye on the show, <laughs> I think, or maybe. Or maybe he's watching this. I don't know. Hey, Mike. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Anyway, Mike's uh, Mike's tuning in, so that's great. But uh, we'll go, we'll get to talk about uh, Mike's itty bitty radio telescope in a on a future. That's a really cool uh, thing. That's, and I don't want to yeah. really let the cat out of the bag here because it is pretty cool. So we'll get yeah. Mike to do a talk on that for sure. Uh, so there, from there, uh, we've got the uh, Rosanna's fun facts. I think Paul, is that what we're coming up with next? I think so I think so. So uh, I think yeah. I got a little now. The problem with Google Hangouts is that we can't play sound on Google Hangouts. So, Peter, I hope you're tuning in because i got to kind of do this a little bit oddly, but uh, let's play a little bit of uh, Peter's uh, commitment here to, our, to our, our program. Okay, here we go. Rosanna's Fun Fact. So hopefully that came across okay. I love it. <laughs> I do too. That's awesome. I really I like it. I hope you like that, Rosanna. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of, uh, I think, six clips that Peter sent me. So we've got all kinds of options here to uh, to go ahead with. So yeah, let's play it one more time. Let's go one more time. Why not? Play it one more time. Play all right, it again. here we go. Let me up the right spot here, my speaker, my phone. And we'll play it, uh, hit the play button. Hang on. Well, wait. There we go. Rosanna. 
Rosanna's Fun Fact. <laughs> that suits perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for that. Thanks for your support, buddy. Um, there we go. Okay, so let's uh, let's take uh, our talk now from Rosanna's Fun Fact for this week. All right. Okay, so this week in Rosanna's Fun Facts, um, we're going to talk about molecules. Okay. So, so basically, you've never forgot the first comet or first eclipse, but for, for a while it seemed as though the universe has forgotten its first molecule. So when the universe was young and the temperature had fallen below 4,000 Kelvin, ions of light um, elements produced in the Big Bang recombined, and the helium ions, He2+, and He2, or He+, rather, were the first to combine with free electrons, forming the first ever neut uh, neutral atoms. So in this metal free environment, neutral helium atoms form the universe's first ever molecular bond. The helium hydride ion, HEH+, plus, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as recombination uh, continued, the first ever molecule was deconstructed, leading to the formation of molecular hydrogen. So despite the importance of this first molecule, scientists couldn't find it anywhere. Researchers managed to create some in 1925, so they knew it could exist, but it just couldn't be found. So in April 2019, an international team of astronomers used the Flying Observatory, SOFIA, to finally detect uh, these molecules within a, glass, a, a gas cloud known as NGC 7027, and, and, and that's a planetary nebula about 2,900 light years from Earth. So finally, after decades of searching, the first has been found, <laughs> and that's it. That's uh, Rosanna's fun fact for this week. Excellent. It molecularly come together. It did. <laughs> Just that easy. Just that easy. Thank you very much, Rosanna. Yes. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Rosanna. Really appreciate all your fun facts coming through to us. And uh, we don't have a segment uh, this week for photos of the week. We didn't receive any this week, but uh, are always available to have some. So if you'd like to send in some photos for us to, uh, to feature here on our show, it's the Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. All one word, Sunday Night Astronomy Show. So send your photos in, folks, and we'll, uh, we'll get a chance to, to bring them up here and, and feature them in our program. Uh, and from there, I guess we're going to go to uh, – Paul, you're going to take a look now to see if you're able to pick up uh, M81, M82 well, maybe? Well, actually, um, you know what you should do? You should probably do a little segment because okay. I have to do a little – got to search for it first okay. now that it's dark enough. Yep. All righty. <laughs> so um, – yeah, what I was going to do is maybe do a little bit of a talk on the scale of our universe. So let me see if I can find my folder. And I guess I have to get you to stop sharing, Paul. Maybe. I... Are you sure? Oh, you did stop sharing. Yeah, I did. Oh, you did. Yeah. Maybe i got to share my screen. There we go. Okay, so I'll share screen one. And see if I can get my presentation up and going here. So let's see if you can get this one popped up here. I want to go down a little bit further than that, though. This is a part of a course that I had offered um, at the uh, Hampton uh, uh, location that we were running our uh, beginners workshops uh, that we ran the first uh, week last week, and then of course the uh, the, the uh, COVID-19 uh, shutdown came about. So we uh, we ended up uh, uh, canceling out of the show for now. And I'm going to see if I can get the right slide up here. I think I can do it maybe this way. So I'm just going to go through uh, maybe uh, five or six different slides uh, dealing a little bit with the scale of the universe that we have. Um, what I was trying to do was 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 basically uh, show you how how large the universe is. And this is where I started with the with the presentation at our uh, at our workshops. Of course, our workshops were four weeks long, uh, scheduled four weeks at the beginning. Um, and then uh, what happened was uh, we canceled our last three weeks until a later date, but we will be back to, to feature our last uh, three dates for sure. So when I started the presentation, it was more uh, showing this little uh, little diddly here, uh, Earth as seen from Voyager 3.7 billion miles away. So this was a, a photo captured by the Voyager uh, 2 spacecraft back in uh, 1990 as it uh, was uh, 3.7 billion miles away from home. So uh, Carl Sagan, everybody knows who Carl Sagan was, I guess, uh, a very famous uh, 
astronomer, and uh, he had been um, irritating, I guess, NASA for a number of years uh, to have them turn the cameras uh, back towards the solar system before they turned off the cameras for good after they had uh, passed Neptune. Uh, so uh, they did. he did convince them to turn the cameras back and take a picture of the solar system. Now, um, we were able to get uh, seven, I guess, of the nine planets, but what I wanted to focus on was this one planet right here, our, our little planet Earth, seen here as one pixel um, suspended in a sunbeam from 3.7 billion miles away. Now, uh, the Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1, is now over 20 billion kilometers away from home. It takes more than 26 hours to get a message to it, uh, one-way light time. So traveling at the speed of light takes 26 hours to get a message to it. It's unbelievable how far away it is. It's traveling away from us at uh, the rate of about 17 kilometers every second. Um, so <clears throat> the speed is immense. <clears throat> and, uh, and the idea that uh, it's out that far is, is pretty amazing to me, I guess, and, and to most. But... I wanted to basically just show where we are in relation to everything else out there. So uh, now I did have a video here, but I'm using a Windows 7 laptop, which is not going to allow me to play the video, so I'm going to have to skip the screen and go to maybe the next one here. Uh, we, we are getting into galaxy season now. This is their spring time of the year, so galaxies are upon us. And uh, I wanted to show a little bit of an example of what our Milky Way, uh, how our Milky Way compares to other galaxies. So here's our Milky Way on the on the top uh, left there, I guess, on the far left-hand side, as you can see. And uh, our Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across with about 400 billion stars in it, uh, possibly uh, one planet around uh, every star, so possibly up to 400 billion planets in our Milky Way alone. But compared to the Andromeda galaxy next to us, which is about 2.5 million light years away, and Andromeda has uh, about uh, 1 trillion stars in it, but these are tiny galaxies in comparison to some of the big, big, uh, big beauties out there. Uh, here it says the galaxy on the right of this image is IC 1101 in the Abel uh, 20, 2029 galaxy cluster. It's the largest known galaxy in the universe and can, contains about 100 trillion stars. So the numbers here are, are just uh, mind-boggling, I guess. Before I get into uh, talking about uh, the size of, of objects that were that are out uh, from here, we're going to start spinning our way out to to parts of the of the uh, of the universe. I want to talk a little bit about light uh, a light year. What is a light year? We hear that term quite a bit. Uh, so it's the length of time it takes for light to travel in one year. Of course, um, light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second, or um, 160,000 miles per second, I guess. So uh, when we're uh, one thing that, uh, a concept that people get kind of, uh, ooh, ah, when they're at the telescope, the eyepiece, when I try to describe them how far things are away, when they ask me how far things are away, <clears throat> is I, I look at something like this. So if I was on the moon, for instance, and I had a very powerful flashlight, and uh, you were standing on Earth, and you were looking at the moon, and I was able to, to shine on that flashlight, it would actually take you 1.3 seconds before you got to see the light from that uh, flashlight, because it takes light again. 300,000 kilometers to travel uh, travel um, one second. It, it travels 300,000 kilometers in one second. And the moon is about 400,000 kilometers away, so it takes about uh, light about 1.3 seconds to reach our eyeball from the moon. Uh, if something happened uh, drastically on the sun, uh, we wouldn't know about it for 8.3 minutes because the sun is 160 million kilometers away. Again, at 300,000 kilometers per second, it would take light 8.3 minutes to reach us. To the next closest star to us, besides our sun, talking Alpha Centauri now, we're looking at 4.4 light years away. And uh, then we look at something like the Her Hercules cluster, M13, uh, in Hercules, which is a, a famous uh, summertime object. It's a globular cluster containing about 500,000 stars. It's about 25,000 light years away. And the Andromeda galaxy is about 2.5 million light years away. So to Alpha Centauri, if we could see Alpha Centauri in our sky, um, we would see it as it was 4.4 uh, light years ago. Remember now, if something happened to Alpha Centauri, if it exploded for some reason, uh, went supernova, then we wouldn't see the light from that explosion for 4.4 years, because that's how far uh, away it is in, in terms of light speed. Um, 
If we were to look at the Hercules globular cluster M13, uh, we see it as it was 25,000 years ago. And when we're looking at the Andromeda galaxy, we're seeing it as it was 2.5 million years ago. So when you see the Andromeda galaxy through the eyepiece, and it just appears as a fairly large smudge in the eyepiece, it won't appear like this, uh, simply because our eyes are not designed to be able to collect photons of light. Um, all the light that we see is really f is light energy, and uh, just described as photons. So photons travel through space at the speed of light, and then they reach our retina as we're looking in the, uh, the eyepiece. Um, so when you're seeing those photons, they actually left an Andromeda galaxy two and a half million years ago. So we're seeing it as it was two and a half million years ago. Also, the photons that fall on your eyeball would not be the same photons that fall on my eye. So when I'm looking at Andromeda through the eyepiece and you're looking at Andromeda through the eyepiece, you see a completely different view, really, because you're seeing it with different photons. So it's your unique connection to the universe. It's, it's, it's your personal connection to the universe. By, by catching those photons on your retina, they traveled for two and a half million years to reach your retina. So every time you look up in the sky, you're seeing the sky as it was. You're seeing it as it was back in time. And then the farther back you're looking, the farther back in time those objects really are. So it's a different, it's a difficult concept to look, to think about when you're looking at the sky, you're not seeing as it is at that moment. You're seeing it as it was, because depending on how far away the object is, um, those objects take time for the light to reach your eyeball. Uh, a really cool one is kind of like Jupiter, where Jupiter's about 42 light minutes away. So and when you're looking through the eyepiece to, at Jupiter, you see Jupiter in four of its moons. And it's kind of an odd concept, but when you're looking at it and you see Jupiter in two moons on either side of Jupiter, for instance, uh, those moons have already moved in their location, but you haven't seen that movement yet uh, at your eyeball, so uh, they've moved 42 minutes ago. And they don't take that long really to orbit Jupiter, but uh, they, there would be a slight uh, difference probably in position over almost an hour time. So uh, that's the concept of, of, uh, of light years. We had to go to light years because distances are so vast. Uh, one light year is actually 10 trillion kilometers or 6 trillion miles. So when we start talking about numbers in the trillions, it's very difficult for our minds to, to absorb it at all. So but let's take a look now from that uh, explanation out to where we are. <clears throat> so here we are sitting on what we call the Orion Spur on a small piece of, a, of an arm that extends out the Perseus arm. And then we can see this, the Scutum Centaurus arm and the Sagittarius arm. Um, here, as we're looking here, if we looked straight up, we would be looking at our summertime sky, which is the big bulge there in the center, uh, where Sagittarius sits in the sky. But we're sitting about two thirds of the way out uh, from the center, about 26,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. But let's, uh, so all the stars that we see at night are in the Milky Way with us. Uh, we decided about 25,000 light years from the center on the Orion Spur. And one light year is actually 6 trillion miles or 10 trillion kilometers. And we share this space with over 300 billion other stars, probably tens of billions or hundreds of billions of planets, actually. You want to take a spin out a little bit farther, though. If we uh, went out to this one, our Milky Way galaxy is just really part of a larger cluster known as the local group. And it's a collection of three spiral galaxies our own Milky Way, uh, Andromeda here, and uh, the Triangulum Galaxy. And then dozens of dwarf galaxies, with probably a number of them not uh, even discovered yet. So we start talking about the number of stars in this area. Which we talked about the number of stars in the local group here. We'd be looking at over two trillion stars in this local group. Uh, if we step out another step from here, our local group is actually part of a larger cluster known as the Virgo Cluster. And it's a collection of over 2,000 galaxies, and it spans about 15 million light years. And the Virgo Cluster is just a small section of a much larger group uh, known as the Virgo Supercluster. And our supercluster contains over 50,000 galaxies, and it spans about 100 million light years. Now, the number of stars that are in this Virgo supercluster, over 200 trillion. And from here, we'll take one final step out. 
and this isn't the whole thing, but uh, we'll step out to look at our neighboring superclusters, and now we're looking at all galaxies within about 1 billion light years from home. So you know that astronomers talk about looking back uh, 13.7 billion light years. Uh, but this is only 1 billion light years out. And uh, here our Virgo supercluster is just a minor member at this scale. You see it there in the center. Galaxies and clusters of galaxies are not uniformly distributed either uh, in the universe. There are large uh, areas that are actually a void of any galaxies, which would be uh, complete darkness. And at this scale, we are looking at over 60 million galaxies. So the number of stars that would be apparent at this scale, at over 60 million galaxies, about 250 quadrillion stars. So one final note, uh, there are millions of these superclusters in the observable universe. And uh, we've just now seen uh, just less than 7% of the complete picture in these uh, few slides that I've shown you. So that's about all i got to say about that. How tiny we really are. And I assume you're still there, Paul? Let's exit out. Oh, there he is. <laughs> he's there and he's gone. <laughs> And that's why he's not talking. So I guess we're alone for a few minutes, folks. So uh, we'll hold on for a second to see what Paul's up to. He must be out to the garage there trying to, uh, trying to get things lined up properly. Well, let's carry on. A couple more slides. Hey, there you are. He's back. We'll do, uh, we'll do just a couple more while we're waiting for Paul. Hey there. Got no volume for you, Paul. Can't hear you. Sorry about that. There you go. Got your back. I'm up, I'm up and running, but I, for some reason, I can't seem to get it to find three stars to align on. Okay. Uh, you want us to give it another minute? Stars. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, just just another sure. minute, and I'll see if I can. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on with a few more slides that I that I had uh, at the workshop okay, there. Great. So, just hang on, Thanks. folks. And I'll see what we can do. So, from current slide, uh, let's go from this one. There we go. Okay, so this is a view that we would normally see through our our evening sky. I want to be sure that I'm still live here. We are. <laughs> Mike says a bigger hammer, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so this is what we would view for our Milky Way I mean most of us have seen this shot in the summertime sky um, and uh, what I try to relate to people is that picture yourself a piece of pepperoni on a pizza so you're sitting on the on the pizza and you're a piece of pepperoni and you're looking out at the edge of the pep of the pizza now you can't see the whole pizza from above because you're just a piece of pepperoni sitting there but if you were to look above the uh, the uh, the plane of the of the of the uh, Milky Way, you would get to see the spiral arms and everything else. But in our case, we're within the Milky Way. We're inside it, so we can't see the spiral arms. But astronomers have theorized that that's that's what we would see because of the uh, the detail that they picked up through through the Milky Way. The central bulge there is in the middle, and uh, the uh, the thickness of the arms and the amount of stars that are in those arms are there. So that's basically our place in the in the universe. And where we are, where we are located. Uh, of course, we're not in the center of the universe. We we might have thought of that one time, but not anymore. Now, I I also get a question a lot about uh, why do the stars appear so much crisper and brighter in the wintertime sky? I get that question quite a bit actually uh, at the eyepiece. They just say, you know, the sky seems to be so much crisper and brighter, and there is a reason for it. Um, probably the best known reason here is um, if we look at our sun here on the right hand side. We'll see that in the summertime, we're pointed back towards the center of the Milky Way, uh, towards Sagittarius and, and uh, some of the summertime constellations there. So we're looking basically downtown New York. And if we were, we'd have that big light glow cast by the, the tens of billions of suns that are sitting down at the center in, this, in the uh, galactic bulge there in the middle. Um, so stars don't appear 
as close because they're really not as close. They're, we're looking farther and farther away, and we've got a lot of light pollution, I'll call it, light glow to deal with. So stars aren't really as crisp uh, then. But when we look at our wintertime sky, we're turned away now, looking back out into deep space. So the stars are, we're looking back into one of the spiral arms. Now the spiral arm is actually closer to us because we're on the spur of one of the arms. So the spiral arm that we're looking at, mostly the Perseus arm in the wintertime sky, those stars are actually closer to us, though they appear brighter. And the sky is darker behind it, it's blacker. So the contrast is there between the bright stars and the, and the black background. So that's why the stars appear to be much, much crisper and brighter in our, in our wintertime sky. And here's a sample shots that I got from uh, someone on the internet that uh, posted a couple of uh, skies. Here's the summertime sky on the right-hand side with all the galactic bulge and everything in it. And here's our wintertime sky with the Perseus arm. So the, scar the stars may not appear as bright here because he's added more filters to it, but uh, they're actually brighter on the left-hand side there, and they're closer to us, uh, higher contrast in our wintertime sky. And uh, here's a star chart that might be familiar to some. Um, what we would see in our summertime sky, of course, we connect the dots in all cases here to, to form our constellations. I mean, I, I loved to play connect the dots when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> never quite played them like this, though, because I really wouldn't understand what I was doing. But <laughs> connect the dots was always a fun game. And, and uh, here we are now playing connect the dots. So all we're doing really is breaking the sky up into 88 pieces. And uh, inside those pieces, we're looking for objects that, uh, that may seem familiar or something that we might be interested in, in finding. So um, if I had a map of New Brunswick and I uh, had an actual map of New Brunswick, I could find St. John easy enough by, by taking the map and, and following the road marks down to St. John. I'm doing the same thing here when I try to find objects in the night sky. Uh, for instance, uh, here's the uh, Pegasus uh, Square, Great Square of Pegasus, the constellation of Andromeda sitting here. Uh, here's Cygnus and Draco, Cepheus, all kinds of constellations in around this area. So this is our summertime sky. If I spin around to say our typical wintertime sky, here would be our wintertime sky. Um, here's uh, Orion sitting down here uh, with its uh, with its uh, sword here area for the Orion Nebula, the three stars that make up his belt. Uh, and we can use these constellations, some of them anyway, as a signpost to find our way around to other objects in the sky. Here's Ursa Major up here, which is actually what we call, some of us call the Big Dipper. And uh, the last two stars of the handle point up to Polaris, which is our, our North Star. And uh, somebody, Daniel, all the stars we see at night are in the Milky Way or globular cluster, right? So, Daniel, that's right. Um, there are about 160 globular clusters that actually orbit the Milky Way. And uh, when we see stars inside those, we're looking inside, um, we're looking inside a globular cluster, which can be anywhere from uh, 10,000 to 500,000 stars. Uh, and, but all the other stars that we see, and typically about 4,000 stars from a very uh, dark sky site, um, would be in the Milky Way with us. We can't see stars from other galaxies with our naked eye. Here's a typical view that we would get in our summertime sky. So summertime, again, we're turned back towards the Milky Way, uh, and we're looking downtown New York here again with the big uh, central bulge there, and here's the constellation of Sagittarius sitting here. So some of the some of the uh, more common things are things like star clouds, which are loosely bound, uh, uh, gravitationally bound, huge collections of stars in the sky. Uh, nebula, which are the either the uh, the birthplace of stars or the dying place of old stars. So there's things like the Eagle Nebula here, the Omega Nebula, uh, the small Sagittarius star cloud. <clears throat> star clouds and nebula are very common all through the Sagittarius area. Anything that has this cross symbol in it, and this is taken from a program called Stellarium. If you're interested in a nice planetarium program for your desktop or tablet, uh, try downloading uh, Stellarium from stellarium.org. Uh, if you don't want to download the program, you can actually go to the website, uh, stellarium.org, and they have a web-enabled uh, uh, version now, so you don't have actually have to download any software. But it'll give you, it'll, once you set it up, you can get a view of the sky just like this and give you an idea of what's going to be up uh, that particular night in the sky. So here's an example of all the globular clusters as well. Uh, all kinds of them here in the summertime sky to take a, a nice look at. And they're, they're nothing more beautiful in an eyepiece than to see a really nice globular cluster. All these pinpoint stars. Looks like a bunch of diamonds that were dropped on a piece of black velvet. So all kinds of, uh, of really nice, interesting things in our summertime sky. 
And uh, here's a look at uh, <clears throat> at our uh, wintertime sky with Orion sitting here. Our 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 wintertime constellation, I'll call it the, the one that becomes most familiar to most people, is is Orion. Above that is Pollux and Castor of uh, of Gemini. Here's Procyon, uh, Sirius, the the brightest star in the sky. Uh, of course, this has a waxing crescent moon. That's that's a, a particular night. I just copied this from my Facebook page, but uh, a lot, there are a lot of uh, uh, things here to take a look at, like the double cluster, which are huge, two huge clusters of stars that sit uh, beside Cassiopeia. Uh, the ET cluster sitting there, which is a cluster of stars that looks just like ET or an alien. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy is another one. So these are popular uh, wintertime targets. <clears throat> and here's a group of other objects that... Uh, are really popular uh, any time of year, and this is called uh, the Messier object list. Um, there's 110 objects here that were discovered by a guy by the name of Charles Messier, lived back in the 1760s, and he was a comet hunter. He liked to, uh, to try to find comets, so he would go out and take a look at part of the sky and try to find comets. Well, he would see these fuzzy little balls and his little um, um, oh, fuzzy little smudges or patches of balls, whatever, in his little tiny telescope, and uh, he would think it was a comet. He would go out a few days later, take another look, and hey, that, that ball hasn't moved, so probably not a comet. So he would determine, uh, okay, there's one that's not a comet number one and not a comet number two and not a comet number three, but he didn't really understand what they were. He just knew that they were fuzzy patches in the sky that weren't appearing to move. Of course, later, as we developed better and better telescopes, we were able to determine that these are actually uh, nebula, which are, again, large clouds of dust and gas, um, or they were actually galaxies, or they were clusters of stars, or they were uh, uh, globular clusters. Uh, and so he determined that there were 110 of these objects that we added to, to a list that we called uh, the Messier objects. So a lot of these are, are uh, available through the winter. Some are available through spring, um, a lot through the summer. And there's a tip, right around this time of year, there's something called a Messier Marathon, where you can get almost all of the objects uh, in this list if you stay up from one night till the, till the next morning, basically. I haven't quite done the Messier Marathon yet. I don't know if you have done it, Paul, or not. but No, never done no, it. No, so it's something you probably should look at maybe sometime down the road. Let me get time. Yeah. Of course, another thing that we see a lot in the in our sky are shooting stars, um, which really, of course, aren't stars. They're they're pieces of debris that are that have been left behind by a comet or an asteroid that has uh, uh, circled around the sun. Uh, for instance, like the P or the Perseid meteor shower that comes around uh, every year in August, which is a really nice show. Uh, uh, some years it's better than others, but uh, it's it's a nice August night to be able to sit out and enjoy. Uh, if you if you get the right. Uh, a cycle of the moon, I'll say. Uh, when the moon is uh, not full and washing out a lot of the sky, um, you would get the moon at maybe a new phase or even the first quarter moon where the moon goes down early. You've got a nice dark sky and you get to catch uh, some of these pieces of uh, debris that have been left behind by the tail of a comet or uh, by an asteroid. And every, one, every year our Earth passes through the tail that was left behind there and sometimes we go through a really thick part of the trail and it's a really nice show. Sometimes it's a very thin part of the tail, and it's a very weak uh, show. But either way, you've still got a chance to get outside and, and catch a few of them for sure. Um, when you are uh, looking for a comet uh, uh, trail like this here in a, in a meteor shower, um, they do have particular names. There is a Geminids, there is the Orionids, the the uh, <coughs> the uh, Perseids, like I'm talking about here. Um, and that's really the constellation where they appear to come from. So if they were the Perseids, they would appear to come from the constellation of Perseus. Now to see them, though, you wouldn't want to stare at the constellation of Perseus. You would actually want to put your back to it. Uh, it's similar to uh, snowflakes coming against your windshield when you're heading down the highway. You see them coming straight towards you. That's great. But when you look at them out to your side window, they seem to f be flying by, and you can see them for a lot longer period of time. So you would want the same thing with the... Uh, with a meteor shower, you'd actually want to put your back to it and watch them come over your head and then come uh, on either side, left or right. Best thing to do, too, is be out with a friend or, or family member and uh, be sitting there in a comfortable chair and uh, one of you looking one direction, one in looking the other direction and shouting out to each other if you happen to see one. So sometimes you can get these that, that'll pass uh, across uh, a, a good portion of the horizon, depending on how, how big they are. And they're hitting the atmosphere at, at a very, very fast speed, too. Um, so it, I'll just talk a little bit more about Paul still getting set up there. 
Paul, you're well, still? I'm, I'm set up as good as I'm going to get because uh, I, I can't get it to stack, but I do have an image. Okay, perfect. Let's, uh, where are we at for time-wise? We're beyond. We're beyond. Oh, okay, let's get out of this. Then. That's okay. That's, that's enough of this stuff. Oh, for listening <laughs> to us. <laughs> I'll go with two more slides. Just these two on uh, using a constellation as sign plus. All Actually, right. we'll, we'll save that one for next week. All right. Well, I'm uh, ready to rock okay. with it. I'm going to have a this. You know, uh, this is, this is, it's not a great image, but it's an image nonetheless. And uh, and I'll show you what a real image would look like when you actually take a picture of it after. So I'll get you to share your screen there, Paul, if you would. Yeah. So second one, one more adjustment there. <clears throat> eh, too much. All right. Screen. Share screen. And there you are. So like I said, it's not a terrific image, but it's an image nonetheless. And it's live. And it's live. That's this amazing. is happening right now, right outside of my house. I, I, I can't get the stars to, uh, I didn't get any, a lot of time to focus on this, so. It's happening right now and probably been happening for about a billion years, but. <laughs> live, 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 live. <laughs> <laughs> So there is uh, M81 and M82, uh, Cigar Galaxy laying right down here on the side. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, Spiral Galaxy or Spiral Toss. So we can see that. And I'll let you go ahead and do your homework on it. Oh, good. Uh, so <laughs> discovered in December 1774 by J.E. Bode at Berlin, these two deep sky favorites hold secrets between themselves. Uh, photographed as early as uh, March 1899. Um, this pair is central to a group of galaxies encompassing the northern circumpolar constellation of Ursa Major and Camelopardus. Say that one fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just wait, hang on a second. We're just checking on uh, questions here. Uh, we're on a Messier. Oh, so Trudy's working on a Messier list right now. Good stuff, Trudy. New moon coming up. Good, good time to do it. That's right. <laughs> Mike again to infinity and beyond. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, yeah, these two galaxies can be seen uh, up by, by Ursa Major. So we had the Big Dipper there. Um, I don't know how else to describe it from the Big Dipper. But the, the if you take the bottom left-hand star of the pot and the top right-hand star of the pot and extend it a line out from those two about the same distance as those two stars are apart, then you would end up in the general area of these two galaxies here. And uh, uh, at some 36,000 light years in diameter, M81, uh, here is one of the densest known galaxies. One third of the mass is actually concentrated at the core. <clears throat> and its glow is, comprised, uh, is the comprised luminosity of 20 billion suns. Often mistaken in this telescope for an edge-on spiral, M81's neighbor, M82, shows no sign of swirling. As a true space oddity, the light from M82 journeying back to our eyes is polarized. This galaxy probably contains a supermassive magnetic field. Not only is M82 polarized visually, but it's also a powerful radio source. Within its broken structure lay, lay huge masses of dust accompanied by the radiance of stars possessing unusual spectral qualities. These facts lead scientists to believe that a violent outburst may have occurred within the galaxy as recently as 15 or 1.5 million years ago, about the time when our own adventurous ancestral species began seeking patterns in the night sky. It is estimated M82's defining event released the energy equivalent of seven, several million exploding suns. Shock waves emanating from the galaxy greatly resemble synchron synchroton radiation. This phenomenon was first discovered in association with planetary nebula M1, but within M82 on an enormous scale. Roughly every 100 million years, M81 and M82 make a pass at one another. Immensely powerful gravitational arms reach out and intertwine to produce a spe spectacular embrace. It's theorized that during the last go-around, M82 raised rippling density waves which circulated throughout M81. The result? Possibly the most perfectly spawned spiral galaxy in all of space. And these are two galaxies that are 12 million light years away from us. So we're looking at light here that left there 12 million years ago. 
M81 is among the nearest and brightest spiral galaxies, visible even with binoculars at dark skies. It's also one of the nearest to our own local galaxy group, being only some 12 million light years from our celestial backyard. As with almost all spiral structural galaxies, star formation is continuing to take place inside this grand galaxy along the arms. When shown in specific wavelengths of light, it can be evidenced as pink areas of light where the hydrogen-2 regions exist, while the blue areas are home to countless new stars. So we can't really see that, uh, that color detail in here at the moment. We are live, live stacking, but... Uh, Actually, I'm, I'll, uh, you continue to talk and I'll, I'll get you a really nice image of it. Okay. There you go. Oh, that's there not the one. No, yeah, that's that's, that's not, oh, that's no, nice. <laughs> no, that's, no, it's actually not. Uh, just, just continue on. Oh, and that, that's, oh, that's, you can't be showing that now, Paul. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the best you got? Uh, no, I, I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but M81's influence left M82 a broken galaxy filled with exploded stars and colliding gas, a galaxy so violent when, that it emits X-rays. Reactions induced by colliding dust and gas called the, caused the birth of these numerous brilliant stars, stars capable of creating extremely dense atoms, some of which are now excited by the kind of extreme motion that induces immense magnetic fields. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's uh, Actually, the end uh, may already... There you go. There, thank you. Oh, that's that's much better. Now you can see it. Now I can see it. So this is a photo captured by live stacking, I assume, Paul? Well, this one here, um, it was... Uh, actually, I captured it um, on my computer. It's about two hours worth of data, so probably about 50 images, I, I guess. I think I stacked about 50 images. Nice. And um, they were three minutes each. So um, with this, now that you can actually see what's going on, mm. um, what I found fascinating about this, besides the two galaxies themselves, were all the other galaxies that you could see within it, like down here. Right. The galaxy. Um, as you go further up, um, where are they at? They're just, there's another one right there. Mm -hmm. Like there's galaxies all throughout this image. So if you can um, take an image like this uh, and look, of course, at the two main structures, that's all, you know, that's what we want to see. But there's so many other galaxies that there's another one right down in there. <laughs> They're just mm. everywhere. They are. They are everywhere. And, and that area now, like that's coming up now between Leo and Virgo, mm -hmm. um, we're getting into the, the, what we call the galaxy season right now, because that, that, big area we call the realm of the galaxies is starting to appear. Leo is starting to get higher and higher each evening and that's always a thrill for us because we're into the season now where galaxies are really apparent. Um, of course we get we get to see some of them through the telescope in at any time of year because these ones here are what we call circumpolar so they're orbiting the the, uh, the North Star or they're, they're surrounding the North Star all year long so we get to see them uh, all year but this, this nice cluster that's going to be popping up now behind Leo, especially under the bellow Leo, the, the Leo triplet there. And actually, that's, that's in, about, in, a, in a combination of about 20 galaxies right there. But even between the tail of Leo and down into the, the head of Virgo, we're looking into what we call the realm of the galaxies. In that area, is, there's upwards of 20,000 galaxies. Uh, and you can pick up several galaxies in your eyepiece at the same time. That's, that's the amazing part. Like these two, yes, when you get a... Uh, say a 32 millimeter, when I'm using my C11, uh, a 32 millimeter uh, eyepiece will just capture the two of them in the in the uh, 2800 millimeter focal length. So anything smaller than that, uh, you should be able to get two galaxies in the, in the, in the same shot. Uh, but when you start looking at around the tail of Leo and down into the head of Virgo, you can get five to six galaxies in the same shot. And that's, that's amazing to see all these little tiny smudges and then realize what you're really looking at are you know, the light from tens of billions of suns there in, in that in that one little area. So as as we start to get into our Leo season, which is the one I <laughs> when I keep pump <laughs> Leo, have, Leo. Have Leo. I mentioned that before, Paul? Maybe? I mentioned Leo. <laughs> maybe, maybe once or twice. <laughs> is that your middle name? <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. Oh actually I am a Leo, so there you go. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the season that I look forward to the most when especially with Paul's shots, because Paul can capture some amazing uh, uh, data there and I'm kind of looking forward to his his capture of, of uh, some galaxies in between the uh, the tail of Leo and the head of Virgo again um, 
but yeah, these uh, these uh, spiral arms that we see here on uh, on the galaxy, we we have to understand too that that the the arms don't all rotate at the same speed. So what happens is that a lot of the material, uh, the dust and gas that's left there behind, gets compressed into uh, into large star forming regions. So that's what uh, as you're spinning that galaxy around. Um, Parts of that are spinning faster than others, so the faster stuff gets kind of collected, bunched up against the part that's moving slower, and uh, that's what causes these immense uh, star star forming regions. And that happens in our galaxy as well. So that's where these uh, these blue these uh, young blue stars and the, this bluish color that we see there is coming from the light from these uh, hot young blue stars that are just forming in there. So every galaxy has a star forming region like that. I did say in the, on the notes here that the end may also be envisioned. Scientists speculate within a few billion years out of the two, there shall be one galaxy. In, in, indistinguishable, but for the welter of radiation only, uh, such an embrace can create. It is known as uh, this same fate awaits our own galaxy. Billions of years from now, our own galaxy and its largest neighbor, the uh, great spiral galaxy in Andromeda, will perform the same uh, duet. So it's heading towards us, and we'll take about 4 billion years to get here. Uh, I think it's 110 kilometers per second it's traveling at, something like that. Wow. Yeah, and it's still going to take 4 billion years to get here. So these are really nice, uh, fantastic-looking uh, galaxies for sure. This this really gives you, you know, in a, when, we're, when we're thinking about galaxies in our in our mind, this is what we get to see. If, if I might, Chris, um, uh, Mike was asking, first of all, is that image cropped? No, it's not. Um, this was shot with um, um, that 120 millimeter um, Skywatcher uh, scope that I'm using. And I actually, I stepped it down uh, to 720 millimeters. So it's a 720 millimeter shot with 120 millimeter aperture. Um, uh, I'm just now that you, I've blown it up a little bit, Chris. I don't know. Can mm. you see that on your screen? Yes. So yeah. look at the galaxy. There's one here. Yeah. There's one, one here. There. Yeah. One there. One there. The whole series of them right down in here. Yeah. Another one there. And if we scooch over here a little bit, you can see there's that a couple one. there. Yeah. And then up a bit, there's another one there. There's another one right there. <laughs> oh, it's just. You could just like just taking one photograph. You could spend you know, a long time just looking for other galaxies. Well, they, they do say that if you took your thumb and held it up to the sky uh, with your thumbnail, you're actually covering 10,000 galaxies. That's unbelievable. And wow. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we might see with our, um, that's what we might see with our, our uh, we wouldn't see that, I mean, less with, with Hubble, but when yeah. Hubble took its shot of, uh, of the sky there, uh, the, the famous uh, ultra deep field shot, it, mm -hmm. it, was, it was focused on a, a, a spot about the size of your thumbnail, and it, it shows 10,000. I don't have that shot right up here available, but I'll bring it up maybe next time. That's amazing. But yeah, that's that's an actual uh, great capture. I actually haul, I had all my notes here on the, the Leo <laughs> triplet, <laughs> but maybe if, yeah, we blah, blah, if we blah, blah, blah through next week... <laughs> It was to the, too low. It was too low, but it'd probably yeah, be nice and high. I'm sorry. Yeah, probably be high enough now. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, but we're into 9.30, I guess, now, just about, so. We are. We're we, just having so much wow. fun. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Time goes by okay. fast. Anyway. Uh, let me see if I can stop sharing here, and then okay. you can. Um, we'll uh, say. There you go. You're Perfect. back. So, we'll probably say our Grenadies for now. Uh, <laughs> It's been a great, uh, great opportunity to bring another broadcast to you folks. Uh, we really appreciate everybody joining on. Uh, don't forget now to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet, and uh, give us a like. We really like that as well. Um, hopefully, we'll have Mike back with us again next week uh, with a Mike Giver segment, and uh, hopefully, his uh, itty bitty radio telescope will go. We'll, uh, we'll make sure that he gives us a talk on that one as well. Um, so uh, we've got a few clear nights coming up. We're not sure uh, what's going to happen over the next little while. Again, we're going to keep an eye on, on our nighttime sky. We're looking at our 8 p.m. slot, and we're really looking hard at it because we don't know what's going to happen uh, coming up through the summer months. Uh, usually in the summer months, we're, we're offering a lot more outreach. Um, obviously, right now, we won't be offering any personal outreach <clears throat> for the moment anyway, so we'll see, uh, we'll see how all, the, all this plays out. But uh, for, the, for now, we'll continue with our 8 o'clock, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, time slot. And uh, if we end up uh, moving the time slot around, we'll be sure and let you know ahead of time. Don't forget, too, to, uh, to send your photos in, please, to uh, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. I would check that uh, 
uh, the address uh, regularly to see if there's anything new coming in. So if you have something that you'd like us to feature on our program here, we'd be happy to talk about it and happy to have you talk about it if you like within our, our comments section. Um, so other than that, I guess uh, we're going to sign off for this week. Uh, just take care, folks out there. Uh, we know that uh, what's going around is is, uh, is something that we all have to be very cautious about at the moment. So uh, we'll get through all this. We we know we are Canadians. We're pretty uh, we're pretty tough people, and uh, humanity is a pretty tough uh, species too. So we'll get through this as we've gotten through all the other uh, uh, viruses, SARS, and everything else uh, over the, over time. Just uh, just take care and be. Be common sense about it all and save some toilet paper from for some of us that really need it. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget, keep your scope. Point it up. Point it up. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, folks, for joining on again. Once again, uh, it was a pleasure uh, being here with you all again. And uh, we'll catch you all again next week. Until then, clear skies to everybody and everybody, uh, please stay safe. Talk to you all Good again night. soon. Good night.